Protest Years is the second in a three-volume series on the history of Asia. Volume 1, which is Professor David Horner's volume, uh, covers the period from ASIO's inception in 1949, uh, its creation then, through to 1963. It covers a whole range of very significant events in Australian history. It covers the whole Venona experience, the issue of the nest of spies that led to the very creation of ASIO. Uh, it talked about its successes and its controversies, the successes being the defection of Vladimir and Evdokia Petrov, uh, and also the expulsion of Ivan Skripov, and also the controversies, the Royal Commission on Espionage, and the ac accusations of political interference, and the fallout, the domestic political fallout, with the split of the ALP that followed afterwards. So David's volume was controversial, but most of the people involved in it aren't around. Um, so the level of controversy uh, is perhaps a little uh, more muted than that around volume two. But before I get to Volume 3, I, wanted to, I just want to talk briefly about what's going to be in Volume 3. This is the period that covers from 1975, from the, uh, the point that Malcolm Fraser becomes Prime Minister, through to 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, which effectively marks the end of the Cold War. This, this will cover uh, the Fraser-Hawke years, the reforms uh, initiated from the Hope Royal Commission, uh, the Kumi Ivanov period, the Hilton Hotel bombing and so on. So I'm very uh, excited about that and looking forward to that coming out in due course, hopefully in October this year. Um, and that was, that's going to be called The Secret Cold, Cold War. Volume 2 covers an extraordinary period in Australian history, from 1963 to 1975, from the, the Vietnam War through to the end of the Whitlam government. And it is uh, a, a great honour for me to have been uh, chosen. Now, the way it worked out is that uh, Professor Horner won a contract, uh, a free, uh, an open tender contract uh, with ASIO for ANU to publish a multi-volume history of ASIO. Uh, and uh, he won that fair and square. And part of the deal was that he would hire an additional historian to write, help him write the second uh, volume and, as it turned out, subsequent volumes. Uh, I was hired along with uh, Dr. Rhys Crawley, who initially started as the research assistant, but who's gone on to help write Volume 3, and he and I co-author Volume 3. So watch this space for Rhys's contribution. The, because of the contentious nature of, of, of ASIO's role in Australia's society, um, as part of the arrangement, a advisory committee was established with representation from the Liberal Party and the Labor Party, uh, and that was with uh, J uh, Jim Carlton and Jeff Gallup, as well as the Director General and, of course, the Deputy Director General of ASIO, uh, Kerry Hartland. Uh, this, uh, this bipartisan committee was established because it was, in, it was important to have both sides of politics, if you like, have some say and have some insight and oversight over what we were doing. Um, but what they did was not so much interfere as help make sure that we weren't interfered with. Uh, and that was very important. And, and in arranging the contract, David Horner made sure that uh, the process was at arm's length. So we were uh, to write it off campus, off ASIO's premises. And so we did that at ANU. Uh, we, d we did that with full and unfettered access. And that is to the credit of ASIO that they actually uh, recognised it was a courageous move to actually, uh, in the, in the uh, yes minister sense, um, you know, to actually really be prepared to let David and I and Reese read the files and write what we thought we should write about what was happening in, from Asia's perspective during this period. Now, having done that, we were then required to give the manuscript to ASIO for them to review it and to consider any issues of libel uh, of legal implications or opera ongoing operational concerns, bearing in mind that ASIO has a very significant uh, responsibility and, and a contractual obligation to protect the identity of those people who have agreed to work for ASIO doing sensitive work. And of course I was obliged, and David was too, to, to comply with that requirement, a, a, a reasonable one. 
But of course, in, in, in writing about this, there's a creative tension that we've had to grapple with, this issue of uh, being considered by the left as an apologia for ASIO, and from the right as some kind of soft on communism uh, excuse uh, for what transpired. Uh, and of course, not surprisingly, I have been accused of both um, uh, along the way. <laughs> um, but the book itself, uh, it's really uh, been a terrific process and thinking about how we were going to structure it. Part one covers the, the, the last of the Menzies years and the last years of the Liberal government. It covers the Vietnam War protest years and we'll talk about, a bit, about that in some detail. About counter espionage, counter subversion and protective security. The three main sort of pillars of ASIO during this period. The main rationale if you like for looking for spies and trying to counter their efforts, looking for those who would try and undermine the state, the subversives, and looking to protect peoples and institutions and documents. Counter-espionage, counter-subversion, protective security. And then, of course, looking at techniques, how ASIO went about its business. And there's some very interesting aspects of that. And, of course, as part of this, a big part of this, is looking at the Soviets and the Soviet bloc. That was a lot of time spent doing that. And also, in addition to that, some migrant groups. And we'll talk about that in a moment. In part two, we look at some issues concerning international engagement and the work that ASIO was undertaking in Papua New Guinea. And Rhys Crawley wrote that particular chapter. And of course, part three, arguably the most exciting part of it, is uh, ASIO and, and the Whitlam years, where we look at this very turbulent period uh, where there are many changes in the way ASIO is required to operate in terms of counter-espionage, counter-subversion and protective security. Uh, there is the, the Murphy Raid, uh, uh, and I'll talk about that in some detail, the fallout from that, and then of course ASIO's involvement in the last days of the Whitlam government. What on earth was going on there? Um, and of course there are conspiracy theories aplenty, and I address some of them. The man who perhaps, along with Sir Charles Spry, shaped uh, the organisation the most was perhaps Prime Minister Robert Gordon Menzies, uh, who had a close and trusting working relationship with the Director General of Asia for much of the, uh, of, of the organisation's history, for most of the period in the first volume and for a large chunk of the second volume, Sir Charles Spry, who was the Director General from 1950 to 1966. Chifley, Prime Minister Ben Chifley, had founded the organisation in 1949, but it was only Prime Minister for a short period until 1950, and then Menzies and Spry were the real shapers of ASIO. And they were the ones who, who, who clearly articulated this three-pronged strategy, if you like, of counter-espionage, particularly on the Soviet bloc, counter-subversion against the, the Communist Party and its offshoots, and protective security, the task of vetting, and uh, worried about facilities and document protection. Interestingly enough, while Menzies uh, was a, a central figure, Arthur Cornwall, the ALP leader from 1960 to 1967, um, was also uh, in, in on things. Um, he denied having a close association with Spry, but the two men met on numerous occasions about Communist Party of Australia, penetration of the Australian Labor Party, and about Croatian matters, amongst other things. So he, he didn't want to really play that up in, in a public way, but he appreciated the role that ASIO had to play in advising him and in advising government. Um, Peter Barber, who took over uh, Charles Spry, uh, was like Spry, was a, was a World War II vet, but he was a younger and more bookish man. And he took over from um, Sir Charles Spry in January 1970 when, when Spry finally retired. <coughs> Barber saw the need for reform and instituted an internal reorganisation. But it really faltered, and the limited reform measures um, that he tried to implement, implement pointed to the need for a wider ranging review. And that would come in due course. The US President uh, Lyndon Johnson visited Australia in 1966, uh, his visit coming shortly after the introduction of national service and the deployment of combat troops to Vietnam. This presented ASIO with significant operational challenges, monitoring protest groups and reporting masses of data which quickly strained the organisation and, and gave it an enormous amount of publicity as well. The period from 1963 to 1972 
Um, so ASIO reporting to a range of attorneys general. Firstly, Billy Sneddon, uh, who later became opposition leader and Liberal Party leader. Tom Hughes, the father-in-law of uh, current Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, Hughes uh, later recalled that the affairs of ASIO formed a very minimal part of his workload. Very interesting observation, given how contentious it was and how important it was for oversight to be uh, effective. Uh, Nigel Bowen, who, like Prime Minister Holt, recognised the need for ASIO, um, and he was uh, in, in office there um, for a, a couple of periods, in 1966 and then in 1971. Ivor Greenwood, who was Attorney General twice and was reluctant to see ASIO resources focused extensively on conservative voting Croats, and we'll talk a bit about that in a second as well. Now, Sir Charles Spry, who was the Director General until 1970, he confronted Menzies' successor by two, uh, Gaw Prime Minister Gordon, over allegations concerning his association with, with uh, Miss Willisey, pictured here. Uh, and relations between Spry and Gordon never recovered from this confrontation. Uh, and it actually spoke to a problem that ASIO experienced in terms of the relationship between the Director General and the Prime Minister that was to a certain extent, you could consider it cosy between uh, Spry and Menzies, but subsequently things weren't nearly uh, as, as, uh, as, as rosy. We mentioned counter-espionage, and this was the main purpose of ASIO since its foundation. And uh, Ivan Skripov, uh, the Soviet embassy official who was expelled as a Soviet spy in February 1963, is the, volume, is the subject of Volume 1, but he features in Volume 2 because many wondered whether poor ASIO tradecraft had tipped off uh, his illegal contact who, who was supposed to have been met in Adelaide. <clears throat> and the passport photo that was uncovered of Mr. X, known uh, subsequently identified as this man, Andrew Hua, um, ASIO officers speculated about whether this was intended for use by a Soviet illegal in Australia. And why was it so hard to figure that out? This was an enduring problem. So fears of penetration uh, were a big issue at that time, but they were dampened down by the word of this man, Anatoly Mikhailovich Golitsyn, a Soviet intelligence officer who defected to the West in 1961 and visited Australia in 1967. He said that Asia was not penetrated, but there, was, there were those who simply refused to believe him. How could this be true? As it turned out, this man was a favourite of the CIA's Deputy Director, James Jesus Angleton. And uh, his role was instrumental in the creation of an organisation called CASAB, which was a counter-espionage focused uh, grouping of the Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, Americans and Brits in the counter-espionage domain. CASAB features in the book. Of course, people they were interested in following were people like uh, Dick Ellis, who was an Australian-born MI6 officer. Um, and in March 1971, information arose pointing to Ellis having been both a Russian and a German agent in the interwar period. Extraordinary. Um, this generated concerns about possible penetration of ASIO in Australia and other organisations. The Russian embassy, pictured here as well on the right, across from the Kingston Hotel near the Marnica shops, pictured here in 1964, was a focal point for ASIO's surveillance work over decades. Soviet espionage was one of ASIO's top priorities. Um, monitoring them uh, in and around the embassy absorbed much of ASIO's attention. The operational base establishment, the OBE, monitored clandestine meetings like this one between Soviet consul Vladimir Alexeyev a KGB, a KGB man, and an, ident an unidentified man in an overcoat. There you go. Got to have, got to have an overcoat. Um, this, the photos are taken at Black Mountain Peninsula in 1970. I, I love these photos. They're great. Uh, the old Canberra. No trees, nowhere to hide. What do you do? How do you conduct counter espionage and counter espionage in this kind of you know, treeless environment? Uh, you park a Ford Falcon by the lake. Jeez, how obvious is that? What are you doing by the lake? Two blokes sitting in a car. <clears throat> um, 
the problem was also that the cars um, weren't changed over very frequently. Um, and a good uh, Soviet uh, officer working out of the Australian, uh, out of the Soviet embassy here in Canberra, uh, became quite familiar with the the, the cars and the, and the looks, and often, um, on occasion at least, would turn and wave and take a photo of the tailing ASIO car. It made it very difficult for the ASIO officers, but I guess that was part of the picture too. The sense of um, that uh, you were disrupting ASIO by making yourself even. That the, 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 the KGB really couldn't get away with it. They knew that, um, that, um, that, um, that they were being monitored and therefore they had to rely on others, such as the Soviet bloc counterparts, the, the people from uh, the Czechoslovakian uh, embassy uh, and eventually the East German embassy and others such as that. Um, and there were people uh, like... Um, Ivan Stenin, in the right, on the right there, who's meeting with Geronti Lazovic. Um, um, Stenin was the second secretary of, of, for press and information at the Soviet embassy. Um, and ASIO looked at these guys really pretty closely, took a lot of photos of them. And here we have, um, uh, we have former ALP leader Arthur Corwell in November 1969. He's meeting, uh, having a chat there with Stenin. Um, and on the right there, Asia took this photo of the Communist Party of Australia member Wilton J. Brown. He's in a car with Lazovic in Sydney in 1972. And this was shortly after Brown was involved in establishing the SPA, the Socialist Party of Australia, as a breakaway from the CPA. So there's a bit of an interesting moment there in, in this tiny little Toyota having this meeting you know, where everybody, you know, if you're in the know, can see who, who's there. I mentioned the Soviet bloc countries. Uh, Karel Frank, who's the Consul General for Czechoslovakia, is seen here on the left with Billy Sneddon in 1969. Well, after the Soviet suppression of the Prague Spring in 1968, Frank opted to stay in Australia. You can't really blame him. And he stayed with his family. Uh, Frank indicated in his debriefs uh, that there were 25 inactive Soviet intelligence officials in positions in Australia in case of war. This put the number Um, Frank, now, Frank, unlike with the Petrov defection in uh, the mid-1950s, Frank was encouraged to apply for permanent residence rather than political asylum. And this is because Asia is really trying to depoliticize the process. We know that there was quite a toxic fallout from the way the Petrov uh, uh, defection worked out politically for ASIO, and they were trying to avoid that uh, recurring. But there were other controversies uh, and other controversial figures, such as Australian-born journalist Wilfred Graham Burchett, who spent much of his career overseas. Uh, a photo here showing him with some Viet Cong uh, people in Vietnam in 1967. But Asia kept files on him uh, extensively. Burchett wanted a passport to visit Australia, and this was eventually issued by the Whitlam government. But eventually documentary proof would emerge that Burchett was on the Soviet payroll. Now, looking at some collection methods, I, I love these photos. These are really, uh, really terrific. Um, and there's a number of collection methods that ASIA would use, humans primarily and technical as well. And, of course, um, when we talk about humans, we're talking about officers, ASIA officers and their agents and sources, people they, they go out and, and enlist to help them uh, in collecting information. And, of course, technical, you've got this wonderful uh, photographic example and there's voice recordings I'll show you in a moment. But this, this surveillance camera was built inside two aptly named books, Christ and Communism and The Nature of Capitalism. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, somebody had a sense of humour when they did that. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the book, the books were cut out to fit the camera in, as you see on the right-hand side there. And there's the, the, the little lens hole there for the, for the guide. Click below, press the button below, and take the photo. It's, it's brilliant. Just love it. Um, and um, then there was uh, radios. We used to hide cameras as well. Here's a Fujika camera. It's built into a national Panasonic radio. Uh, similar idea that you just carry this radio around and point it around and click. And, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, Maxwell Smart, eat your heart out. You know. um, 
And then, of course, there's movie cameras too. Um, and th these are sometimes used as well. And here, this is one hidden inside a panel van. Everybody loves a panel van. Right? Well, they used to anyway. Um, van was used to conduct its surveillance on a range of, act uh, of activists associated with the Communist Party of Australia. So this, you see it uh, pointing through the front uh, window. And here's the back, which I can point through the back. And you, there's a hole at the back there. But this is kind of the a camouflage, if you like, to hide the real purpose of the van. And one of their favourite targets was Lawrence Sharkey, or Lance Sharkey. Here he is taken when he was the former General, General Secretary of the Communist Party of Australia, photographed in February 1966 in the front of Com CPA headquarters where ASIO conducted regular and extensive surveillance. So if you ever walk past this spot, chances, were, chances are there's a photo of you on an ASIO file. <laughs> um, uh, another one was his successor, uh, Laurie Arendt, um, Lawrence Evans, who took over from Lance Sharkey um, as CPA General Secretary in 1965. Mark Ahrens uh, wrote a fascinating book, The Family File, which I've cited, uh, uh, demonstrating the incredible number of files on this man and on the family that ASIO kept over the years. Then there were other interesting figures like Senator Jim McClellan, who often featured. He was close to Lionel Murphy. And he was a really harsh critic of ASIO, claiming it was riddled with right-wing extremists who act like keystone cops. They're so paranoid, they see communists behind every bush. He wasn't far wrong. And then, of course, Arthur Geitzel. He was a prominent member of the Australian Labor Party. He was also suspected of being a member of the Communist Party of Australia. And he was closely associated with its leader, Laurie Ahrens. Uh, Aaron and Geitzel met in secret. 1973, shortly after the Whitlam government's taken office, at the Motor Inn uh, in Wollongong, and ASIO conducted extensive surveillance of the meeting. Of course, this would eventually blow back on ASIO because word would get out. Um, and uh, doing that to a Labor politician when Labor is in office, a little bit problematic if they find out, <coughs> which of course they did. Um, Tom Uren, uh, another interesting figure, seen here participating in a protest march in front of Gowing's menswear store in downtown Sydney in the early 1960s. Uren was reported by an ASIO agent as a CPA member. Uh, he was seen to be in touch with the Czech Consul General, Carol uh, Frank, as it turned out, in Sydney in, in 1962, while Frank was still doing the good work of the Soviets. Um, another interesting figure who features in the book a little bit is Bob Santamaria, a strong-minded Catholic lawyer who I don't need to introduce to people here, who headed the National Civic Council, <coughs> a fiercely anti-communist organisation uh, seen by ASIO as closely linked to the DLP. Now, ASIO was wary of information provided and of the NCC's interest in information from ASIO, and there are those who are quite unhappy with what I said about him. Um, uh, pictured there, just here. Um, because, really, I, I rely, and this is one of the points about this book, I rely on the ASIO records. I'm not relying on others. It is looking at the world through the ASIO prism. And uh, I may be accused of uh, not having captured the full picture. So be it. That's not the point of this book. This book is telling the story the way ASIO saw it. Uh, and, and that's what I've uh, sought to do uh, in this instance. And of course, the way ASIO saw the world was largely about uh, the Communist Party, the Communists, the Soviets, and their protégés in Australia who were funded by the Soviets through to the late 1960s, um, the Communist Party of Australia. Here you see a May Day demonstration in 1969, and by this stage the Soviet funding has really dried up. The Soviets are no longer seeing the CPA as reliable and are looking around for alternatives. So Asia was actively involved in monitoring the CPA activities, with agents participating in surveillance teams photographing and, un and identifying key, uh, key identities using the equipment I, I, I touched on before. The CPA was instrumental in leading anti-Vietnam War protest activity, particularly early on. But by the late 1960s, the protests were much more than just events run by the CPA. And it took a while for that to sink in. A range of other protest groups were monitored, including this sweet group of ladies here on the left, Save Our Sons, who were 
label, and I couldn't quite work out if the label was facetious or not. But that's good. There's a, a, re, a, a cell of dangerous subversives. <laughs> yeah. um, and of course, there, you know, there was a degree of concern about Save Our Sons and what, what effect they were having in terms of the anti-Vietnam War protest movement. Um, but, uh, the, the, you know, it, it, it goes to the issue of how much, how much uh, do you, how much credence you give, how much weight you give to some of the reporting uh, ASIO officers are getting in from the field, from their sources and agents. How reliable is it? How, uh, you know, you, how do you step back and digest this and put this into context in a society that is actually transformed as the baby boomer generation is coming to age uh, and, 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 and people are contesting uh, uh, established truths. <coughs> um, the other picture is of a Hiroshima and Vietnam protest march in Newcastle in August. 1968. ASIO routinely monitored such protests, uh, photographing participants and confirming details through corroboration from agents and contacts. And the files uh, 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 have plenty of information to that effect. Now, the Vietnam War moratorium demonstrations in Melbourne in 1970, this was one of the biggest ever. And while the CPA was involved, the Communist Party of Australia was involved, it became increasingly difficult to explain away the scale of the protests in terms of agitation by members of the CPA or even its, of its splinter groups. There's just too many people here to explain it away that way. Now, um, this one uh, is of um, a Vietnam War moratorium demonstration in Canberra. So here, even here in Canberra, we're getting large numbers of people turning up. But the, the momentum from the demonstrations helped convince the McMahon government, Billy McMahon taking over from John Gorton as Liberal Prime Minister, to withdraw the combat troops from Vietnam at the end of 1971. <clears throat> and that really does take the wind out of the sails of the protest movement at that stage. In the meantime, uh, ASIO had actually second, seconded officers working in Vietnam itself. And this is a little, little known story. Here's a picture of Don Prowse on the left, for instance, who was uh, seconded as a member of the Special Police Advisory Group in Saigon. He had a hair-raising tale to tell, which is captured in, the, in this part two of the book on the international engagement chapter. Here he is shown being awarded a Vietnamese medal for developing courses for the government of South Vietnam. Similarly, Mike Leslie pictured he was honoured with US and Vietnamese medals for his work uh, particularly for assisting the Vietnamese, Vietnamese police uh, with, with a, a number of uh, projects. Leslie was not given any Australian government award for his work. Now, one of the other things that we found in terms of the perceived the counter-subversion task was this issue of monitoring Croatians. Shreko Rova, pictured here in this snapshot of a TV interview on Channel 9 in 1972, um, he was a leading Croatian troublemaker. He appeared on TV in this, uh, in this interview defending the Croatians and attacking Yugoslav uh, authorities. But he, this man had a clouded history, and Mark Ahrens talks about it in his book a bit. But Asia was never quite sure who Rover worked for, but his story would occupy Asia minds for years. And it goes to the nature of the problem that they were facing. Uh, how do you substantiate the evidence, how do you prove, how do you categorically get to the nub of the issue? Very difficult to do. And of course, here we see a, a picture of a Croatian protest in 1971. This uh, shows Croatian demonstrators at the Yugoslav consulate in Sydney in December 1961. Croatian migrants resented the Serb-dominated Yugoslav government and they saw what they do, were doing in Australia through their diplomatic representation as manipulative and deceitful. Uh, indeed, the Yugoslav authorities appear to have been implicated in numerous incidents, of violent incidents in Australia. Uh, and uh, once again, with very carefully covering their trails to make it hard to prove categorically that it was them who were involved. But often enough, it was the Croatian extremists themselves uh, and their actions that were most obvious. Here you have a, a photo of Tomislav Lesic. Um, his legs were blown off when a bomb he was carrying in a bag accidentally uh, detonated prematurely before he got to his intended uh, designated target. 
Now, as, as incidents mounted, cooperation, trust, and mutual understanding between the Commonwealth Police Force, what we now know as the Australian Federal Police, and ASIO tended to falter. This set the ground, the groundwork of mistrust that informed Lionel Murphy uh, in the lead up to the raid of ASIO in March 1972. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, so that's part one. Uh, really, there's a lot there, an enormous amount to cover uh, in, a, in a short amount of time and space. We talked about liaison a little bit with the, the CASAB, uh, with the other countries, and a number of them are mentioned in the book. Um, and of course, particularly uh, Australia's Cold War Frontline, written by Rhys Crawley on Papua New Guinea, a very in, as, in, important chapter on the life of New Guinea as, as we as we involved in helping launch New Guinea uh, and uh, provide them with uh, the, the professional advice to establish their own security intelligence space organisation. Um, an important uh, legacy of, of the Whitlam years was the granting, of course, of independence to Papua New Guinea in 1975. And ASIO had responsibilities there um, in terms of particularly in protective security and preparing a counterpart organisation to be raised for, for when independence is granted. And that story is a very interesting one as well. But perhaps the most interesting one is part three, the Whitlam government, uh, the period of the Whitlam government from December 1972 to November 1975. Um, in, uh, in this period we have three attorneys general, and they're all pictured here on the left, uh, Gough Whitlam, who uh, as part of the duumvirate uh, uh, with um, Lance Barnard uh, for the first two weeks essentially uh, is the Attorney General, makes a lot of the calls. Uh, he then hands over to Lionel Murphy once they are appointed by the Governor General in uh, late 19th of December um, and then eventually kept Enderby, pictured there on the right and we'll talk a bit more about these uh, folk in a moment. Now uh, early on uh, Whitlam invited the Yugoslav Prime Minister uh, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this correctly, but give me, uh, forgive me if I don't get it right, Jemal Vajedic, uh, on an official visit to Australia in March 1973. Now, in light of rumours of Croatian extremists plotting to kill him, uh, Whitlam and Murphy were concerned that ASIO was not sufficiently concerned itself. And this was fed by the views of a former police officer who had been working in a slightly adversarial sense with and against ASIO, if I can put it that way, during the earlier years in monitoring Croatian extremist activities and with figuring out who do you blame? Who do you, do you blame the Yugoslavs or do you blame the Croatians? And it was always very opaque, very hard to figure out exactly who to, who to pin things on. But on the night of the 15th and 16th of um, March, Lionel Murphy visited ASIO's Canberra office on the night of the 15th uh, with the former... Uh, CPF, Commonwealth Police Officer uh, Kerry Milty, and he finds some of what he's after there. But he, he suspects there's more being held in the files in, in Melbourne. And, and Milty feeds this, this suspicion that AG is holding something back from him. So he goes down on the morning of the 16th of March. He telexes uh, early, wee hours of the, the O-Dark 100 um, for the, the Commonwealth Police Force to go and close down ASIO headquarters. And they do that. And he goes, gives a talk to, to a mystified audience of ASIO officers who are in the auditorium at ASIO headquarters. Um, he looks through the files. He realises that what was on the file in Canberra is exactly what's on the file in Melbourne. Um, and, of course, the media has been alerted, uh, and this gets to be uh, a tad emb embarrassing. Not only is, it, is ASIO traumatised by this, the links internationally, people are thinking, what on earth is going on in Australia? Uh, and, of course, the, the papers have a field day. Um, uh, and uh, cartoonists uh, uh, went to town. Uh, and uh, you see there the caption um, that uh, Gough is, is supposed to be saying to Margaret, uh, worrying about Lionel Murphy coming to visit. <coughs> um, and uh, several, uh, several cartoons featured over the next few days. Um, and, and Pickering's cartoon on the right here shows how the Whitlam and Murphy rivalry was accentuated by the raid and its fallout. Um, so there's really no love lost here. Now, during this period, um, uh, Joan Coxedge uh, led a group known as the Committee for the Abolition of Political Police. Now, this is a misnomer. The, Australia isn't like uh, countries like the US or, or Canada who have a, a intelligence service that's linked to the police. 
Australia, uh, Australia's Security Intelligence Organisation has non-executive had during this period very clear uh, a, a demarcation between the police, executive powers, and ASIO's powers. Um, so calling it political police was, a, you know, a political stunt, really, in a sense. But CAP demonstrators tried to embarrass and expose ASIO officers, photographing and then publicising the details of these ASIO officers that had exposed, putting glue in the locks of their cars, uh, going to the auctions of their houses, and making a, a ruckus, and, you know, being larrikins and... Uh, and, and, but this, this caused quite a lot of consternation, not surprisingly, within ASIO. And subsequently, the ASIO Act of 1979 prohibited the, exp the, 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 revela the revealing of the identity of an ASIO officer. So uh, Jones uh, Remus subsequently um, <coughs> was curtailed, shall we say. Uh, but certainly uh, caused some quite, quite a lot of resentment uh, inside ASIO uh, over how this uh, group could could operate with relative impunity, um, uh, although there are some uh, some stories of, of, of ASIO officers in the book um, re resentfully tipping buckets of water <laughs> out through the windows uh, and running, having little scuffles uh, in lifts and things like that that are in the, in the book you'll see. Um, now, while that's happening, the, the, the first incident of reported Middle Eastern terrorism activity uh, in Australia occurred in September 1973. This man, Abdul Hamid Abdullah Azam, was arrested and deported for links with the Black September or a terrorist organisation. Now, in the picture on the right, you see Azam's case, which was fitted with a false bottom. It had apparently been used to carry uh, a submachine gun and three grenades. And, and you can barely make out there the shape of, of, the, of, the, of the bombs and the weapon that were used in that case. Um, and this, in effect was a, a bit of a turning point. We saw the beginning of uh, ASIO starting to reconceptualise what it had been seeing as primarily the counter-subversion role against the communists, and we saw, we saw the dipping in terms of um, potency, if you like, of the communist movement uh, as it fractures and as the Prague Spring really sucks the, the, the life, if you like, out of the zeal of, of good Soviet communists because the, 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 Prague, the Prague model was the one that the Communist Party of Australia was starting to identify with, and it seemed to be the future of, of communism. Uh, you know, you, you do that, we'll, 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 maybe we'll actually get communism in Australia. Of course, the crushing of the Kraus Spring was in incredibly demoralising for the CPA. Um, and um, but this happens at, uh, roughly about the same time as um, as uh, Azam visits, and there's a sense of uh, with the the Munich uh, terrorist. Uh, incident at the Olympic Games in 1972, a growing awareness that maybe Asia has got some other responsibilities. Initially, it's not something Asia particularly wants to get involved in, uh, but increasingly the government's expecting it to act in this space. At the same time, we see a normalisation of diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, which led to the arrival of their first diplomatic de delegation, here kindly photographed by an Asia officer on the 2nd of March, 1973. <coughs> um, the increase and expansion of diplomatic premises of communist and Soviet bloc countries presented Asia with a significant challenge as its resources were stretched. And effectively, we're not seeing a budget grow. We've got a, a mindset in Asia that's quite frugal. Uh, and even with uh, Barber, and particularly with Spry, this kind of World War II, we can do this on a shoebox type mindset that, that, that works if you, for a crisis but uh, is unsustainable in the long term and leads to people taking shortcuts and not, uh, not being trained properly and not being uh, prepared for uh, to sustained uh, campaigns. And of course, not surprisingly, therefore, we find ourselves in the situation where Gough Whitlam appoints Robert Marsden Hope as a Royal Commissioner in mid-1974. And uh, he is tasked to commit, conduct the Royal Commission on Intelligence and uh, Security. Now, Hope's report isn't completed until 1977 and is not surprisingly, therefore, a significant focus of Volume 3, which um, is coming up later this year, hopefully. <coughs> Hope's work would lay the groundwork for extensive reforms within ASIO and beyond in other intelligence agencies as well. And this will be explored in the forthcoming volume. So we had, under Gough Whitlam, we had uh, uh, Kep Enderby, I mentioned, was appointed as uh, Attorney General. Um, 
following uh, Lionel Murphy's appointment to the to the High Court uh, in February '75. Now, Jim Cairns, pictured in the middle here, um, was a leading figure in the anti-Vietnam War protest movement during the Vietnam War, and uh, uh, incidentally a target of ASIO's uh, focus because Cairns meets with people who a ASIO is looking at, um, and so uh, Cairns is all uh, frequently crossing the scopes, if you like, of ASIO's officers tasked with monitoring the subversive uh, groups, uh, particularly the Communist Party. Um, and he was identified as having contact with communists. His appointment as Whitlam's Deputy Prime Minister in 1974 unsettled ASIO and uh, international partners, not surprisingly. John, Senator John Wheeldon, uh, pictured on the right there, was a friend of Jim Cairns uh, and a frequent contact of Ivan Stenen. This concerned not only Sir Charles Spry in the late 60s, but also Peter Barber uh, in the 70s, who suspected that Wheeldon was a CPA member. And uh, I explore that issue a little bit in the book. <clears throat> now, after Peter Barber's sudden resignation in September 1975, Frank Marnie, who had been a Deputy Secretary in the Attorney General's Department, is appointed Interim Director General of ASIO. Ma Marnie stayed through until the transition. He stays until March 1976. <clears throat> um, now, developments in late 1975 saw ASIO what I call in the book ASIO on the brink. This is when relations with US intelligence are on ice. This is when ASIO is uh, asked for a list of CIA officers operating in Australia in October. Uh, that list uh, sees no mention of Richard Stallings, who has uh, been working on Pine Gap but working through the defence conduit. Um, and um, in early November, on the 2nd, the 4th and the 6th of November, uh, Whitlam uh, reacted in, both in, in, in private, then in Parliament, and then on TV to this apparent uh, misinformation or uh, apparent deception. Uh, on the 5th of November, the US uh, authorities sent a letter denying the US's funding uh, 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 any uh, Australian organisation, uh, quite worried about uh, what's going on. On the 6th of November, the US Assistant Secretary of State, Edwards, passed uh, the same message to his uh, interlocutors, the liaison officers in Washington. Um, on the 8th of November, the East Asia Division Chief in, in Washington, American uh, Intelligence Fellow, Ted Shackley, relayed what effectively was, was termed, a, labelled as a demarche. Uh, and that was uh, passed to, uh, to uh, Marnie in, Ca in Canberra, and he quickly makes sure that he gets the message to Whitlam. Uh, and Whitlam reads it and, and dictates a response uh, Marnie cables a reply on the 10th of November, approved by Whitlam, uh, seeking to allay American concerns. And then, of course, the dismissal happens on the 11th. Now, this is uh, a point of much conjecture, uh, many conspiracy theories, uh, of which I'm sure you know uh, as much, if not more, than I do in certain respects. Um, now, the, the Sir Arthur Tang, the Secretary of the Department of Defence, who has uh, oversight for uh, the Pine Gap responsibility uh, and therefore the connection with Stallings. Um, his, his biographer, uh, Peter Edwards, speaks to this. Um, and <coughs> the, um, the point that even Gough Whitlam uh, mentions uh, in his, uh, his writings that, is that um, while the conjecture about the renewal about Pine Gap that was supposed to come up for the 10th of December uh, uh, was, was, uh, was a point of contention that apparently was going to be, some, some would argue, was that one of the reasons why you know, some kind, a coup had to happen, uh, so the conspiracy theorists would have us believe. Um, Whitlam himself acknowledged that he had actually agreed for that uh, to be renewed anyway, prior to this event, um, and didn't see that as a trigger. Now, I talk about the book, uh, in the book about the meeting between Warren Christopher, the, uh, the envoy for uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, in July 1977, who meets with Gough Whitlam, with uh, Richard Butler uh, in attendance. And, and Richard reads uh, uh, a conspiratorial line into a message that can be read a number of different ways about uh, the, the message from Jimmy Carter that uh, don't, uh, don't worry, um, you know, the United States is not going to do anything like that again. Uh, the sense of, oh, you've done it before, uh, that's proof it's happened before. Um, and of course, Jimmy Carter and, and for that matter, um, um, Warren Christopher weren't part of the 
administration that had uh, been involved uh, prior to that. So it's, it's conjecture as to exactly what that meant. Of course, I interviewed Malcolm Fraser as part of this uh, process and asked him specifically what, what he made of all this, uh, the conspiracy theories, bearing in mind that this man was about to publish a book uh, about the United States Alliance, Dangerous Allies was the title, a provocative, thought-provoking, challenging book about our relationship with the United States. He was an opportunity to put the knife in and twist it and demonstrate that, that they really were dangerous. And his response when asked about the conspiracy theories, crap, total crap. Um, so we have a sense here of um, you know, the Pilgers, the McKnights, the Tuies, who said no one has yet proved the CIA played a role in, this, in, 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 in the dismissal. Um, um, and, and that's true. No one has yet proved it. I, 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 I can't prove one way or the other. In fact, I don't think anyone ever will. Um, but in terms of what the ASIO records say, uh, uh, they lent no additional support to the conspiracy theorists' interpretations. Um, and, uh, but like all good conspiracy theories, this one likely will never die. Um, and uh, that's just, it's just an unprovable proposition. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I have given you a tour of the book. I hope if you have not yet read it that you enjoy it uh, and that you get engaged with it uh, and that you come back for more with Volume 3. <laughs> um, but, uh, and let me say, I don't get any royalties from this. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, the royalties for me was the fact that uh, ANU got the contract. I'm employed by ANU uh, and, uh, and so they, uh, ASIO owns the copyright. But as I reflect on, on uh, what was happening, there's a number of dimensions to this, uh, this period of political change, the transition from the Liberal Country Party to the Labor Party, uh, the social change, the baby boomer phenomenon that is, that is challenging the boundaries and making Asia having to rethink what was a cosy, pretty straightforward arrangement from the earlier Cold War years to one that's much more contested and one that's much more opaque. There's the demographic change with more and more migrants coming, changing the dynamics of, of security concern uh, demonstrated by the visit of, of Azam and of the Croatians. There is the economic changes with the downturn in the, in the mid-1970s. Internationally, it's a period of detente, detente but mixed with ongoing Cold War rivalry that's, that's pretty palpable in Canberra right through this period as the number of uh, uh, identified uh, uh, Soviet and Soviet bloc uh, intelligence officers mushroom in the mid to late 1970s. Um, and administratively, it's a significant period because most of the public service, which in the 1940s and 50s had been in Melbourne, has transitioned to Canberra, but ASIO is still in Melbourne. And this presents a significant obstacle for ASIO's integration into government, into being a res uh, appreciated an integral part of the government machinery, and it's one that gets addressed in volume three.